This week on the Backtable Podcast. And again, I'm very much pro biopsy. I just think you have to pick your battles a little bit. And, you know, there are patients where you shouldn't have a biopsy. You're on anticoagulation. We talked about you're very old and infirm, very difficult tumor to reach, anterior tumors that are, you know, you'd have to traverse the liver or the, you know, another organ to get to. We're not talking about biopsying those ones because I think the risks are probably undue. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Backtable Podcast, your source for all things urology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. This is Aditya Bagrodi as your host this week, and I'm very excited to introduce our guest today, Chris Sanderson from Columbia University. Welcome to the show, Chris. How are you doing today? Great. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. So Chris and I kind of go back, overlapped a little bit during fellowship. He's really done some tremendous work on renal mass biopsy for kidney cancer. And I think this is something that everybody sees. I feel like every one of my conversations with a patient with a renal mass is, you know, you get in a car wreck and they say, your liver is fine, but we found a spot in your kidney or you get an MRI of your back. We found something on your kidney. So maybe, Chris, just for starters, how did you kind of get interested specifically in, you know, looking at this at this area, renal mass biopsy, small renal masses? Yeah, I mean, pretty much the same way you did. I think that uh, clearly this is something that we're seeing a lot of. You know, we see patients daily who show up with kidney tumors or kidney cysts or other suspicious areas. And, you know, it's oftentimes a challenging conversation where we're relying on cross-sectional imaging to define a disease process. And I think that there's a fair amount of data out there right now that suggests that perhaps that we're not necessarily treating people the way we could be, or we could be improving how we manage people who have these small renal masses. Yeah. I mean, it's it's kind of wild that once upon a time, like kidney cancer was like the internist dilemma because there's all these perineoplastic syndromes and funky manifestations, flank masses and hematuria and all that kind of stuff. And now it's like, everybody and their brother are getting a CT scan. So, you know, just kind of baseline, what are we talking here? Numbers, common, uncommon, you know, roughly what, what's the incidence of kidney cancer, kidney tumors, maybe even smaller kidney tumors? Yeah. So fairly common, about 80,000 people a year are diagnosed with renal cell carcinoma. That's based on the most recent SEER statistics for the United States. At least uh, one in 40 to one in 70 adults will be diagnosed with a kidney cancer during their lifetime. So that's not insignificant. We've seen a substantial increase in incidence of kidney cancer, particularly over the last 30 years. If you look at the curves, there's been this dramatic increase. And there's a couple of thoughts about why that is, but probably for what you've already talked about is that we're doing a lot of cross-sectional imaging. In the United States, we do tons of scans. We do probably upwards of 80 million CAT scans a year in the United States. In the Medicare population, just shy of 50% of patients will be at risk for having a CAT scan over the next five years. So the more we look at people, the more we find. And in fact, there's a lot of incidental findings on a CAT scan or an MRI, and the kidney is, is one of the major ones. About 2 to 3% of CAT scans or MRIs you know, of the abdomen will find something on the kidney. And I think that's really led to this huge increase in incidence. Yeah, I hear you loud and clear. And, and clearly, there's some consternation that comes along with it until they meet with somebody, and hopefully some of that anxiety is diffused. So maybe just kind of diving on into it, new patient incidentally discovered small renal mass Let's just kind of hit the highlights on critical elements of history, physical, if there are any critical physical elements that you run through. Yeah. So, you know, do a full medical surgical history on every patient as you would for anybody. I think family history is really important to learn about whether the relatives have had any cancers, particularly kidney cancers. You know, you're looking for associations with renal cell carcinoma syndromes, not terribly common, but good to know about. You know, most of these are not palpable on exam. Um, I think reviewing their imaging is of critical importance. I rarely rely on a report that describes some sort of suspicious kidney tumor. I, I usually always want to look at those pictures myself, determine the size, the location, whether it enhances or not. You know, I think a lot of our counseling is based on exactly what a, a CAT scan or an MRI says and perhaps the quality of that imaging as well. Yeah, and, and obviously if they're smoking, I think it's a nice opportunity just to kind of plug them into smoking cessation or any of those types of things as a risk factor in addition to the family history. 
All right, so we've reviewed the imaging, and I'll admit, I, I love a CAT scan. I love a pre- and post-contrast CAT scan. I, I can wrap my brain around that fairly easily. And then when I look at the MRIs, I generally try to go for the sequences that look most like a CAT scan first. And then I, I'm right with you. And then I'm looking <laughs> at DWI and, you know, the in and out phases. And I guess I say this because while, of course, as the surgeon and the kind of front line of the disease, we've got to evolve. But I also think having a high quality MRI program and radiologists that you work with is, is critical. Fully agree. And I, in fact, you know, we're ordering more and more MRIs to look at, at kidney tumors. I think that you get more information out of them. And I think our radiologists are able to give us probably better advice about what they think these things are from a radiographic standpoint. So no question. It's sometimes it's a little bit difficult for me to interpret as well, but I, I do think that they're very valuable if they can be done correctly. Yeah. I feel like I've been able to wrap my brain around prostate MRIs pretty well over my uh, time in this field, but kidney MRIs, I still think there's some some learning to be done for me. All right, so you've got your history, your physical, they've got a small renal mass, which to me is still a quite broad term, you know, four centimeters. Like, is this what you're, is this what you're talking about, right, Chris? Four centimeters or less? Yep. And, you know, my radar for concern at four centimeters is quite different from say like 1.2 centimeters. But let's kind of hear your spiel, if you will, to the patient when they come in with an incidentally discovered mass. Yeah, so I, I think this is definitely worth a conversation. A lot of patients get sent in saying, you have a cancer, you need to see someone immediately to get this removed. And so part of the initial conversation is, let's just, let's slow down a little bit. Let's backtrack just a tad and talk about what exactly are we looking at here? What are some of the numbers, some of the things that we've already discussed? You know, one thing I'll tell people is that, listen, we are diagnosing, you know, tens of thousands of small renal masses a year. We've seen this huge incidence in small renal mass, but Really, this has not translated to decreases in kidney cancer mortality. So there's a possibility that you are here because you've been overdiagnosed with a small mass, meaning you have been found to have something that may or may not impact you for the rest of your life. So that's kind of one way to kind of diffuse the tension just a little bit. I do think that's important, you know, when appropriate. But then I also talk to patients about, well, what could this be? And there's plenty of papers out there that show us among surgically resected renal masses, what are they? Well, yeah, I mean... For masses that are less than four centimeters, about one in five are benign. There's a whole variety of benign masses they can be. And there's a huge prevalence of what are classified as indolent tumors, meaning they are cancerous, usually clear cell, but sometimes variant histologies that have very low metastatic potential and are very unlikely to cause any harm if possibly left untreated. So, you know, we're looking at among patients with small renal masses, who are the maybe 10% of patients who have aggressive cancers and could that be you? So that's usually where I start the conversation is to try to defuse the tension a little bit, give them a little bit more perspective and say, listen, most of the time, this is nothing that you need to be urgently worried about. Yeah, I love that. I'm glad my statistics kind of match with yours. And um, so here's what I do. First thing I walk in, I said, you're going to be fine. You're not going to die of kidney cancer. It's not time to get your papers in a fair. You're going to be okay. And then I'll typically say something along the lines of, if this is 50 years ago, it would have lopped your kidney out. If it was 30 years ago, we would have just removed the spot. And these days, we know that so many of these are so benign behaving. I, I actually borrow a phrase from Scott Egner's active surveillance counseling, wimpy tumors that almost pose no threat to your life. And sometimes I'll actually juxtapose this to say, for instance, like pancreatic cancer, esophageal cancer that are, you know, ones that kind of get our attention in a big way. And sometimes tears of joy, like right there, you can just tell that that, that was meaningful and I agree. And, you know, we might get into this, you know, the incidence of benign tumors in a centimeter, sub-centimeter, one to two versus four centimeters. But, uh, you know, that kind of 80% of these are going to be cancers. But I always say about 90% of those are going to be very benign behaving cancers. And I think that math leads to about 10% of these could be, you know, real cancers somewhere down the way. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So it's a small renal mass imaging. It's got to be what for you? Like, let's say they had an ultrasound or lumbar spine MRI. What's your kind of initial go-to to really understand it now? Yeah, I think really the standard is to have some cross-sectional imaging with and without IV contrast. We like to try to use MRI for this. As I said, I think you get maybe a little bit more information to MRI. Obviously, there's no radiation associated with MRI. Some people can't get that, so a CT scan is perfectly acceptable. But I'm sure you've seen these patients too who show up with a non-contrast CT with a spot on their kidney or an ultrasound with a spot on the kidney. And 
you rarely, if ever, want to counsel patients based on that alone. I think it's really important to get the best information you can to really characterize these lesions as, as best as possible. Yeah. And I mean, unless there's something on a, let's just call it suboptimal imaging modality that's really got my attention. Sometimes I'll just try to push that one down four months, for instance. And, and many times by the time they got referred, got in, you've ordered the test and completed the test, it's, it's going to be somewhere in that vicinity. But then you already have a little bit of growth kinetics and that type of information. Yeah, I fully agree. I think just as you had mentioned that stating up front that, listen, there's no urgency here. We have time. Time is often the best gift you can give patients and they, and they thank you for it. And it's just saying, yeah, why don't we check this again in a couple of months? Very reasonable. I think patients are very receptive to that. And yes, you definitely can get some more information out of that. No question. All right. So, so you've, you've counseled them that, you know, again, unless there's something, you know, if it's like a 28 year old, with like a four centimeter mass, I'm not going to say, Hey, let's just kind of keep an eye on this. Understandably, they may be kind of motivated to get something done, but well, maybe let's talk a little bit about that. When, when are the small renal masses kind of like, all right, this is not one to kind of observe and slow play. This one's got my attention. Yeah, that's a great question. I do think certainly patient age and longevity have a lot to do with it, but I think there's also a lot we don't know. We've learned, if you want to draw some parallels with prostate cancer here, we have decades of follow-up for patients with low-grade untreated prostate cancer, you know, with biopsy-proven untreated prostate cancer, and we know that they have a very favorable prognosis. What's the case for untreated, biopsy-proven, low-grade kidney cancer? We have several active surveillance studies, some of which don't do any biopsies, and so I think we, we have to learn more about the natural history of this disease. You know, is it appropriate to put a healthy 50-year-old man with a three-centimeter biopsy-proven oncocytoma on surveillance or a type 1 papillary RCC on surveillance? We think that's probably a non-aggressive cancer, probably poses minimal risk to that patient's life. Is it appropriate to watch that patient? Certainly, there's some unanswered questions there, but it's not obvious that every small renal mass needs treatment. And does age is age the only factor? Unclear, but certainly plays a major role. All right. So age slash patient comorbidity. I think if they have any hereditary cancer predisposition syndromes that are associated with aggressive biology, is that weighing in? Absolutely. Yeah, that would be kind of, for me, a different type of patient. If it was an HLRCC patient, a BHL patient, you know, these ones that you're watching very carefully, you have kind of thresholds for when you might want to consider an aggressive treatment. And so those, I completely agree. I think probably most of these patients would be the incidental, solitary, small, solid renal mass. Those are the ones that probably most of our, we're coming into our clinic most of the time. And assuming in a healthy person, is there a size cutoff where you're more inclined to kind of start the conversation about we're likely going to be treating this? versus the size criteria where we'll likely start off with observation. And of course, we're going to get to biopsies at some point, which is the the focus of this talk. Yeah, I, I don't know if, I think it, it varies a little bit based on age and comorbidity and so forth. I certainly have patients who are in their mid 80s who are you know ill, who have six centimeter tumors that we've been watching for years. And likewise, there's patients who are very young who may not tolerate surveillance for even very small tumors. So I, I do think it's very individualized. I don't think I have a, a specific cut point, but the bigger they are in general, the higher the risk of more of, a, of an aggressive pathology. And certainly there's the patient anxiety that comes into play too. As much as you try to reassure people, knowing that you have a five centimeter tumor on your kidney makes you anxious. And some people you know, may or may not want to monitor things depending on how their health is otherwise. Yeah. I promised myself I'd refrain from any type of generalization than sticking my foot in my mouth, but I don't know. This is kind of my gestalt. If it's less than two centimeters, I have a hard time signing that person up for an intervention. This is, of course, is broad strokes. You know, I think the downside of interval imaging in four to six months, a biopsy is so low. You know, your likelihood of a missed opportunity of a window for a cure is so low that this is broad strokes. And of course, I want to kind of get your opinion. And then in a healthy person, 50s, 60s, maybe like hypertension. Really, as we start getting above three centimeters, I at least will, I'll still try to keep the anxiety level super duper low. This is extremely manageable, but I don't love watching tumors bigger than that. The, the broad strokes, just throwing it out there. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I think going back to what I was saying earlier, that there's a lot we can learn still about how much is size relevant. Is that the only relevant factor? I mean, that's something that we can see, we quantify it, we follow that. For patients on surveillance, we've learned that rapid growth is bad. Stable growth does not rule out malignancy. So how much should we be worried about size alone? I think that's where we probably can get more information on these patients. And there's different ways we can do that. Biopsy is certainly one of them. But I think we can probably move towards a smarter algorithm to try to better risk stratify patients compared to looking at your CAT scan and telling you whether or not you should have surgery or surveillance alone. Totally, totally. Yeah, and I think, I mean, size is obviously variable. There can be periods of no growth and then exponential growth or linear growth, and it's impossible to know that with serial scans, but it does impact treatment efficacy, particularly for some of our ablative options. Absolutely. Yeah. The small tumors, usually very, very well suited for ablation, depending on the location of the tumor. And as they get bigger, yeah, ablation just less effective. You have a number in your head where, you know, once they start kind of crossing thresholds, you're like... Yeah, certainly the two centimeters and less, just like you said, I think that's a, a great size that's well suited for a successful ablation. You know, there has been effectiveness for larger tumors than that, but very small ones, less than two centimeters, are almost always effectively ablated. Yeah, I mean, I trained at UT Southwestern and Jeff Kadedu was kind of a pioneer on RFA. And it always seemed that the data suggested after three centimeters, you saw a substantial drop off. Now that that's not like a 90% efficacy versus 50. It was low 90s down to the 70s. But I'll say that's a little bit tricky as they start approaching, in my mind, three centimeters. Do you pull the trigger? Do you continue to watch? Is repeat ablation really that big of a deal? Any kind of thoughts on that, Chris? That's one of the things that I talk to patients about where we're headed towards some sort of treatment and it's like, do I want a surgery? Do I want to avoid surgery with an ablation if that's appropriate? And I do tell them that, you know, if you compare surgery compared to ablation, the ability to cure cancers is about the same, although that might require a second ablation in a handful of patients. And so some people are very happy to avoid surgery at all costs, even if that means two ablations. Although for people who kind of want that one and done treatment, then surgery probably makes the most sense for them. Fantastic. So we're trying to figure out what comes next here cancer, no cancer, if cancer, dangerous cancer, histology of cancer. Any other, you know, do you use nomograms? Are there, are you using SESTAMIBI scans? Are you, what kind of information are you trying to glean here that you think is robust enough to help your decision making? Yeah. I mean, there, there have been multiple different questions asked about how can we better figure out what this tumor is based on our CAT scan alone? Does an MRI help? Well, maybe a little bit. Are there nomograms that can help? Probably not. The nomograms actually don't appear to be that effective. And there's a, a review that looked at several of them that said that they just weren't very good. There's some PET tracers that have been studied. I think there's a lot of interest in them, including Sestamibi. There's been a couple of studies that look at Sestamibi. That's a tracer that looks at mitochondria-rich structures, which oncocytomas are. And so the thought is, well, if you have a system maybe pet positive renal mass, that it's probably an oncocytoma and maybe you can avoid any aggressive treatment. Well, I think the jury's still out on, you know, whether or not that's, that's the best way to identify or rule out the presence of an oncocytoma. There's ongoing studies on CA9, which is another pet tracer that looks for clear cell carcinoma. I think we have to learn whether that's going to be helpful, but a lot of interest in that at least. And then surgery, you know, taking it out and doing doing an excisional biopsy, which is what we've historically and continue to do, where we'll say, hey, listen, I don't know what this is. There's probably cancer. Let's take it out and let's see what it is. We'll do a partial nephrectomy, a robotic partial nephrectomy, or even a radical nephrectomy if needed. And then I'll tell you in a week whether or not we were right. And, you know, that's a very effective treatment for cancer, very high cure rate for small or even confined kidney cancers. But I mean, the collateral damage here is that you're taking out like 5,000 benign tumors a year, which exposes patients to cost of treatment, to risk of treatment. And you wonder, is it possible to avoid surgery for benign tumors or vice versa? Is it necessary to remove benign tumors from the kidney? Similarly, we are removing tens of thousands of what are considered indolent tumors from the kidney. Should we be doing this? Are these tumors that need to be removed? This brings up the concern of over-treatment now. We've, we've had these discussions with prostate cancer, not only over-detection, but over-treatment. Are we seeing the same thing for kidney cancer, where we're not only over-detecting it, but are we over-treating it uh, with, with all of these surgeries? Possibly. 
Yeah, I mean, you just kind of took the prostate cancer analogy right out of my head. You know, low volume, grade group two disease, small pattern four, a lot of interest in focal therapy, which I think is coming. It's coming. It's here. But uh, I certainly think you could make a case for whether that should be treated. And there's no free rides, right? I mean, somebody's going to have an issue, problem, or complication. And another disease that, you know, I have significant interest in testicular cancer. And I feel like, for instance, robotic RPLND is such a generally different operation than open RPLND. And robotic partial nephrectomy, which has now been around for decades, literally, is such a different operation than open partial nephrectomy that people may feel that, oh, I can just do this, hospital one day, no heavy lifting for three weeks and get on with it and it's done. But whether that ultimately is in the in the patient's best interest is tough. Absolutely. And that's been shown too, by the way. I mean, the, the diffusion of robotic surgery has led to increase in use of nephrectomy, specifically partial nephrectomy. So we're seeing that. The more CAT scans you do, the more nephrectomies you do. The more robotic surgery that's being done, the more nephrectomies that are being done. You know, whether or not this is actually helping patients with their kidney cancers is yet to be determined, frankly. Yeah. So I think just to kind of complete that thought I had from earlier, I kind of, you know, mentioned that like half a century ago, you would have gotten a radical quarter of a century ago, a partial, somewhere in the last 20 years, ablation, now observation. And this is what I tell patients, you know, we can either monitor it with without a biopsy, we can burn it or freeze it, or we can cut it out. And we can generally do that robotically. Where are you kind of thinking about an upfront biopsy? Yeah, this is a great question. I'm, and I'm, I'm glad that we're able to talk about this. And there's a lot, I think, that I don't know that we collectively don't know that we still need to learn about. But uh, I think that it, it does provide value. And I think there's a lot of patients who benefit, frankly, from having a biopsy. Historically, biopsies were not used. Doctors didn't want to use them. They didn't trust them. You know, there's problems with biopsy performance, et cetera. And we're seeing an uptick now in the use of biopsies. So there's, a, there's gaining momentum here. But, you know, I do talk to patients about it. And I talk to them about it because of a lot of what we've already discussed, which is, listen, it's unclear if what you have is something that's dangerous to you. Maybe I can do a test to give you more information to help you understand whether this is a tumor that could be a threat to your life and whether this can help inform what type of treatment to recommend in your case. Fantastic. So some of them, little chip shots, history of other cancers that are legit. Easy. Yeah. Rule out metastasis, rule out infection, you know, inflammatory conditions, hematologic people, you might have history of lymphoma. And that's all in the AUA guidelines. That's when we should, without question, be considering renal biopsies. Solitary kidneys. Stakes are high. Yeah, you don't want to get in there. Good news is it's benign. Bad news is you're on dialysis. You're on dialysis. That's that's (laughs) never good. Same for bilaterals. Do you like biopsies and bilaterals, Chris? Yeah, I do. Actually, actually, I think they can be very valuable. And sometimes if you're thinking about maybe some sort of a syndromic picture, then that might, you know, point you down a certain pathway. Absolutely. If you're considering an ablation biopsy before or at the time of? So that's controversial. Like there's different practice patterns there. Um, I will say that there are several series now, institutional series, that have suggested that biopsy before, whether you do ablation or surgery or anything else, it does change treatment decision-making. There's large studies from Canada, UC Irvine, Atrium Health in Carolina that have found that if you do biopsies more regularly, you're less likely to surgically remove benign tumors you're more likely to use active surveillance. There's some data that suggests that perhaps some types of ablation work better for non-clear cell compared to clear cell. So maybe that could help inform your decision-making in those cases. But at the very least at the time of ablation, sometimes that's not even done in itself, but at the very least you want to do a biopsy at the time of ablation, but optimally even beforehand. Makes sense. So then um, broad strokes, I think the AUA guidelines indicate that you shouldn't do a biopsy if it's not going to change your decision-making. If they're 100 years old, a couple of heart attacks and a stroke, real mass, you're not going to do anything, don't biopsy them. Absolutely. Yeah, that's easy. If, if you're not going to touch a patient, you're not going to ablate them no matter what. Don't stick any needles in them. It's not going to affect your decision-making. Okay. So how do you describe what a biopsy is going to be like to the patient? 
I would say it that it's a outpatient procedure. It's usually done under ultrasound guidance, maybe with some local anesthesia. They're awake. You take usually a coaxial sheath or a thin needle, put it through the skin, and then put another needle through it, similar to the needles we use for prostate biopsies. It's safe. I say tell people that there's a low chance of having a complication from a biopsy, but it's usually self-limiting, like hematuria or flank pain. It's very uncommon to have any high grade or bad complication after a kidney biopsy. You know, the main risks that I talk about are that there's this kind of this nagging, persistent risk of non-diagnostic biopsies. And I think this is one of the biggest limitations of the kidney biopsy as, as we do it today is that anywhere from 10 to 15 of them are just non-diagnostic. And then you've went through all this trouble. You had a procedure. Maybe it was a little uncomfortable or maybe you've had a complication and you didn't get the answer you were looking for. And I think that's frustrating for patients as well as as well as for doctors. But it's very clear. It's very important to be upfront about the fact that, yes, you may be faced with that non-diagnostic result if we, if we go down this road. Yeah. And I appreciate the coaxial sheath description because patients will often ask, you know, is this going to spread the cancer or cause it to misbehave? And I try to explain how a separate needle comes out and then retracts within the sheath and that prevents uh, dragging tumor cells across any kind of non-cancerous areas. So non-diagnostic, we'll, we'll, we'll jump into that in a bit. Well, actually, all right, so we're trying to figure out cancer, no cancer, if cancer, what type of cancer, and is it dangerous? So cancer, no cancer, what are the kind of performance characteristics of a biopsy? We're talking about 18-gauge, not FNAs, right? Correct. 18-gauge biopsies, core biopsies, particularly, if possible, multi-quadrant biopsies. So if you sample a tumor in a couple of different places, it, it definitely helps improve biopsy accuracy. So that's the type of biopsy we're looking at. How accurate is it? It's actually reasonably accurate. If you get a diagnostic result, it's very good. It's a very high sensitivity for determining cancer versus no cancer. We're talking mid to high 90s. It's highly specific as well. One of the criticisms of biopsy has been, well, you know, there's a lot of heterogeneity in these tumors. So what if you're not assessing grade accurately? Well, it's actually reasonably good at that as well. Probably 90, mid 90s in terms of accuracy for grade, especially if you categorize it low versus high grade, meaning grade one, grade two versus grade three, grade four. It's pretty good at that. And it's also reasonably good at determining type of histology. So if, if it was cancerous, what type of cancer it is. Perfect. And you know, the non-diagnostic rate, sometimes you'll see, it's interesting, right? For every type of image guided procedure that I've interact with over my career, there's a couple of shots of like a needle going into whatever is of interest. And sometimes, you know, you kind of see this like skiving and you're like, huh. <laughs> and I'm not- <laughs> Not sure they got that one. <laughs> I'm not passing judgment. I recently started mm -hmm. doing transperineal prostate biopsies. And I mean, in some form or fashion, that was an exercise in humility. You know, my good old fashioned transrectal approach, there was not a lot of doubt of kind of where I was and what I was doing. So- I'm not passing judgment, but there is some technical prowess, finesse, familiarity with these. The kidney moves, is the capsule thick, whatever that can kind of impact this. Absolutely. And, you know, so what else impacts non diagnostic rates? Or, or when would you maybe think twice about doing a biopsy on somebody who you suspect that it's just going to be futile? They're not going to find anything. You know, if it's very, very small, I think those are ones that are hard to hit. Cystic masses tend to be more likely to be non diagnostic. Very endophytic tumors, also more non-diagnostic. And then the longer skin to tumor distance. So if you have very, very large patients, you know, those are much more difficult targets to hit. So you'd want to, you know, when you're having that conversation with that patient, you're saying, listen, you could have a biopsy, but it's probably, it's going to be probably pretty tough for you to get that. Yeah. The cystic masses, I like that, that you brought that up. I feel like historically it was, don't even attempt it. Maybe if they got a decent intramural nodule or something along those lines and you're considering surveillance because I don't know how you feel about this, but I think it's actually the size of the enhancing nodular component more so than the fact that they have three centimeter fluid filled cyst. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that's where, you know, really good cross-sectional imaging and perhaps even MRI can help you. And a good radiologist will say, hey, listen, this is a Bosniak 4 cyst, but there's only a three millimeter nodular component or something that maybe perhaps makes you a little bit less worried. What about upper tracts? For exchange biopsies, yes, no? You know, I haven't done a lot of those, but I uh, I have ordered several. I, I think that the concern for the upper tract biopsies has historically been that you're going to seed the tract and you're going to spread the cancer. Not a lot of evidence to support that. And now there's actually evidence to suggest that ureteroscopic biopsies might increase the risk of bladder cancer recurrence or, or other complications that could be avoided. So it's on the map. It's not 
totally part of the routine standard process yet, but perhaps in the future. Yeah, without kind of getting too far off kilter here, I think for infiltrative masses that are into the parenchyma suggestive of upper tract, the data suggesting tract seating is an issue is pretty weak, actually. It's get a biopsy, get on with it, save them an anesthetic, all that, and then some of the um, some of the considerations in terms of bladder recurrences, so, so I'm a fan. All right, so negative biopsy, good luck and good night, check you later, or how does that work? Right. So, I mean, there's different negatives, right? There's the, you have an angiomyolipoma, you know, you have an oncocytoma that's negative for cancer. I don't think I would ever discharge those patients from clinic, but they're basically, at least in my mind, put on an active surveillance protocol where you might monitor that, but you would adjust the frequency and intensity of monitoring based on the, what you find in the biopsy. The non-diagnostic biopsies are a, it's kind of a different dilemma. I think that that's either where you're thinking about repeating a biopsy in some cases, which usually if you do it twice, if it's if it's an appropriate tumor, you'll get a result, or empirically treating, which that's currently what we do. But those can be those can be frustrating uh, frustrating results at times. Yeah, I think I like the idea though that you kind of for the higher risk for a non-diagnostic with the criteria that you shared, you kind of preface it so it's not a was something done wrong or things along those lines, just like, hey, this happens, it happened to you, and we were going to sort it out. So maybe just kind of running through like a couple of case scenarios. So central hyalur tumors, do you like biopsying those? You know, I am wary of tumors in challenging locations. I think that there are risks of biopsy, which are probably much higher if you're doing it in, you know, right around the hilum, around the vasculature, May, may not be worth it in that case. Yeah, I struggle with this one because I absolutely share those concerns. But then, for instance, I sure don't want to do a radical nephrectomy if it's a potentially super, I mean, most of the time you can kind of shell it out and it works out. But I'd like to know that I'm removing a cancer if there's a more than the kind of standard 1% to 5% chance conversion to radical. If I'm thinking like there's a, I don't know, a 15 20% chance this kidney is going to be in the bucket, I'd kind of like to know that it was cancer. I, I'm with you. And again, I'm very much pro-biopsy. I just think you have to pick your battles a little bit. And, you know, there are patients where you shouldn't have a biopsy. You're on anticoagulation. We talked about you're very old and infirm, very difficult tumor to reach, anterior tumors that are, you know, you'd have to traverse the liver or the, you know, another organ to get to. We're not talking about biopsying those ones because I think the risks are probably undue. Now, there have been some creative ways of doing biopsies. There have been, you know, endoscopic transduodenal biopsies. I've seen those be done. Those are pretty uncommon. And if it was, you know, that important to do, it can be done. But I, I um, you know, not, not every tumor is amenable, frankly, amenable to a safe biopsy. And that's just, I think that's just where the facts of life at this time. Yeah, I'd never really thought about it, but obviously for like pancreatic masses and pulmonary nodules, they do endobronchial biopsies. Why not? You had mentioned I haven't done biopsies for upper tract. Are you actually doing biopsies? Me personally, I am personally not, although there are urologists who are doing them in clinic under ultrasound guidance successfully, safely. You know, they're publishing on this. Uh, it's something that I think we all should be taking notice of. I mean, we do you mentioned prostate biopsy. We do prostate biopsies without any concern. And with, this is all ultrasound guided. We're all very good technicians. Now transperineally, we can use image guidance now. Should kidneys kind of now be part of our repertoire? Maybe. I mean, I think if renal mass biopsy turns out to be something that is really more accepted and something that we all advocate for our patients getting, then it's something that we could consider integrating into our own practices. It does take, there's a little bit of a learning curve but it's not insurmountable. Yeah, I'm having flashbacks of my early transperineal days, but, uh, <laughs> well, I mean, for, uh, yeah, I mean, I've got partners that do, you know, ultrasound guided percutaneous access for their PCNLs. And again, not, not the kind of focus of this conversation, but wouldn't it be nice if you have this old infirm patient with obstructive polynephritis, you ultrasound them, pop it in a frost tube and get on with it versus the whole coordination with other services and whatnot. Yeah, I, I don't know that that's, where I'm going to spend my efforts imminently, but there's also, you know, pretty cool technologies bringing in MRIs into the office, for instance, where say, for instance, you didn't feel super comfortable with ultrasound guided biopsy of a renal mass, nearly certainly with an MRI or something cross-sectional, you might, super helpful. So 
complex Hyler tumors, jury's out, case specific. That sounds reasonable to me. Young patients. So maybe I'll, I'll just explain my thought process. You know, do I want to consider doing a radical versus a partial for a small renal mass? And do I want to consider doing a lymph node dissection? I would like to know if I'm dealing with something, you know, HLRCC or, or other medullary aggressive variant. How do you feel about that, Chris? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if that's, that's not always the reason I necessarily would recommend a biopsy, you know, whether we should do a radical versus partial. Can you do a partial nephrectomy on a high grade tumor? I mean, yeah, you can do that. Lymph node dissection. I mean, I think that's a, probably a different discussion. Should we do any lymph node dissections on which patients, high grade? Should any patient get a lymph node dissection who's clinically node negative? Perhaps, yeah. Maybe if we knew that you were very high risk and we could quantify that or characterize that before surgery, maybe we should be selecting those patients for lymph node dissections. A lot of unanswered questions there. I, I think that, you know, in my mind, the main role at this point for a biopsy is to kind of help both the doctor and the patient be swimming in the same direction. And I think this is useful for shared decision-making. We did a little bit of work on this and published a small study where we actually asked doctors and patients before and after a biopsy about what treatment they want and were interested in initially, how confident they were. And what we found was somewhat surprising that actually all the patients enjoy, thought the biopsy was important and it really helped them improve their decision-making. And it also helped the doctors improve their decision-making. And there was a much higher concordance in the treatment recommendation and treatment selection after the biopsy compared to before. And so that, you know, I think that was eye-opening and very validating to us. I worked on this with a couple of my residents, Jane Kurtzman and Rain J. Chung, who we all learned a lot from this. And I think we have been using this to counsel patients going forward saying, listen, if you're having a hard time making this decision, I just threw a whole bunch of statistics at you. You might have a surgery for benign. Maybe we can watch it, but it's 10% chance it's cancer, you know, aggressive. Maybe we can just do a procedure, get that information, and it will help you make a, a more informed decision. Yeah, that's safe. I generally quote about a 1% risk of bleeding or something along those lines. Sound okay? Yeah, I think that's about right. Yeah. All right. So you've mentioned some of the challenges, non-diagnostic rates. Those are tough. Some of them are going to be inaccessible or anticoagulation or, you know, retro renal colon or some other anatomic scenario. One of my least favorites is an oncocytic neoplasm. Oh, man. <laughs> what do you do with that, Chris? Those are the worst, aren't they? <laughs> that, that really makes you, well, kind of frustrates you a lot. So the, this, is, this is also a limitation of the biopsy where you get a kind of a wishy-washy read. And this is, you know, even the best pathologist can give you a, this kind of uncertain diagnosis that either this is an alcocytoma or perhaps a chromophobe renal cell carcinoma. I think, you know, really, first of all, it's been shown that these tumors in general have a very favorable prognosis. And even if you chose to survey an oncocytic tumor that actually was a small chromophobe renal cell carcinoma, those tend to do very, very well. So I think overall the stakes are lower. It depends a little bit on, I think, the individual patient and their, their risk tolerance, but it's a favorable risk group. There is a chance that you have, you're sitting on a, a cancer that has not been proven to be cancerous, but at least you know in general that this is not something that's going to be urgently dangerous. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I think it's just another bit of information that allows you to like diffuse some of the anxiety and say, even if we're dealing with the cancer, the likelihood of this being a dangerous cancer is exceedingly low. We're not dismissing you. We're going to monitor it. And then if, you know, the growth kinetics or the size or the appearance or whatever changes, you either pull the trigger, do something or repeat a biopsy. Yeah, absolutely. So this has been uh, super informative. And I guess it kind of brings us to some of the kind of global 10,000 foot view questions here. Maybe I'll just ask you, Chris, what are those What are those questions in your mind as you're considering, do I operate or not, or do I treat or not treat? Do I do a biopsy? What are some of the things that are kind of running through your mind? Yeah, I think, you know, patient goals are very important. And I, you know, we, we take a lot of time talking to our patients about what their goals are, what their interests are. You can kind of help point them in the right direction. I think that, as I said, I, I think that we can in generally really improve how we treat this condition, which are the small renal masses. And there's a lot of kind of greater philosophic questions that I would pose, like, is it acceptable to accidentally remove a benign kidney tumor? Nowadays, if you can, if you can, let's say hypothetically, you can know with high certainty whether or not a tumor is benign based on this biopsy or a PET scan or an MRI or whatever it is, is it acceptable to say, oh, sorry, we took out your benign tumor? That's one question. You know, I think we should have a greater discussion about this. Which patients benefit from treatment of indolent tumors? 
if we have said that, listen, there's a group of patients, a fairly large group of patients who have small renal masses that we think are indolent, and there's been several studies showing that indolent tumors behave indolently. They are not aggressive. They rarely, if ever, metastasize or cause cancer-specific death. Should we be treating these aggressively? And if so, for which patients? Should the well, young patients, all patients? And then lastly, can a biopsy help us avoid this concept of over-treatment? I think over-diagnosis is going to be hard to fix. You know, that's not really within our control. We're not screening for these tumors. These people are showing up in our clinic after having a CAT scan for something else. But what is in our control is how we manage that patient. And I, I would argue that there is an element of over-treatment right now, and it has been going on for years and decades. And can something like a biopsy help us turn that back, help us spare patients unnecessary treatments? And, and you know, it may be. And some of, these, some of these studies that we talked about already suggest that perhaps it can. And I think that's a laudable goal, frankly. I don't know why. I mean, I guess this is my own bias. Like, for prostate cancer, it's pretty easy to convey that. And maybe because... Maybe because there's so much press out there on overtreatment and, you know, men that have been kind of maimed because of the functional consequences. Of, maybe that's a part of it because there's a pretty substantial functional consequence. But it doesn't, for some reason, kidney cancer, I don't know why, it's in, inexplicable to me, seems both for providers and patients a little bit harder to wrap their brain around non-intervention, active surveillance, however you want, however you want to kind of frame it. And just like over the course of what you were saying a second ago, is it acceptable to remove a benign tumor? I had a super fit 79-year-old patient, six and a half centimeter renal mass, didn't look like a classic spoken wheel or whatever. I was like, all right, you're fit. Your other kid looks fine. You know, we'll just, we'll do a radical nephrectomy. You stay in the hospital a day and you're back to it. And it was an oncocytoma. And I was just like, oh my God, that's terrible. You know, and thank God she did fine. But like, what if she didn't? You know, that would have been absolutely a catastrophe. So like you mentioned, I think we're continuing to learn. And I mean, I don't know if I biopsied her and it didn't come back as a clear cut oncocytoma, you know, here I'm twiddling my thumbs again. And so I think, I mean, that's one end of the spectrum, healthier or elderly patients that are fit enough to receive an intervention. And then the young ones, I also find it a little bit tough. I mean, you know, something small, 1% chance risk of metastases, if you monitor it, the likelihood of it going gangbusters in four to six months is small, but... It just seems that the acceptance of of surveillance is a little bit more challenging. I think a biopsy could help help galvanize that. Definitely. And in fact, the minority of the small renal masses are managed with surveillance right now for many of the reasons that you already discussed. You know, what's the right amount of surveillance? We've, we've defined this for prostate cancer, right? That, you know, in Europe, they're doing a great job on surveillance and we're still catching up. At least the most recent data would suggest that we're still aggressively treating a fair amount of patients with grade one prostate cancer, whereas they're not doing that overseas you know, what's the right amount of surveillance for small renal masses and what are the right patients for that? I think that getting better information can help inform that question. A biopsy, you know, there's many emerging tissue-based biomarkers, I think, that probably are going to be playing hopefully a bigger role here going forward, where they can give us a better estimate of uh, disease biology and aggressiveness, maybe apart from what histology shows alone. And this is what, you know, we've been doing with prostate cancer for years. So why can't we do it for kidney cancer? Perhaps we can, and perhaps we will. Yeah, I was going to ask what gets you kind of excited, tissue-based biomarkers. I think, uh, you know, non-invasive tests, uh, things are moving at a pretty breakneck speed, cell-free DNA. Maybe you pick up on BAP1 mutations for a small renal mass and say, okay, it's time to go. Or, you know, there's some mutations associated with indolent clinical behavior, and you can kind of sit tight and, and potentially obviate some of those invasive tests, as it were. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot of hope that we can do something in the tissue of a kidney tumor, particularly cancerous one, that can, you know, we can glean from a biopsy that will give us a lot of that information that, hey, listen, you're 55, but you have a indolent appearing tumor with a low cell cycle progression score or whatever other tissue-based biomarker we happen to have at that time. And I think that that can provide a lot of reassurance to the patient and maybe help him or her make a decision. Now, to your point, though, like, what are the risks here? What are the stakes, right? A partial nephrectomy, we're really good at these. We're really good at robotic partial nephrectomies. Our interventional radiologists are really good at ablations. You know, we can remove these tumors or ablate them with minimal risk, but it's not zero risk. And so I think, you know, I think we still have to consider the fact that these are not completely harmless surgeries. They do put people out of work for a couple of weeks. They have incisional pain. There's a low chance of bleeding or urine leaks or, you know, injury to something around the kidney. And, and that's not trivial, even though it's very rare. Yeah, I mean, 
you know, nothing's better than something, I suppose, if it kind of fits the disease state. Well, Chris, you know, I've certainly learned a ton over the course of this last 45 minutes. Any kind of parting thoughts for the listenership as we conclude? It's been my pleasure. I really enjoyed speaking to you as well. I think this is a fascinating topic. I, I do think there's a lot we can learn in this space and hopefully a lot we're going to be able to improve going forward here. So exciting space. Stay tuned. And it'd be interesting to have this discussion five years from now and see where we are. Agreed. All right, Chris. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at underscore Backtable on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable is hosted by Aditya Bagrodia and Jose Silva. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhirter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, with support from Devante Del Brune. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Administrative support provided by Jimmy Lee Thanks again for listening and see you next week.